For almost three years, Russia continues its genocidal war against Ukraine. In order to justify this war, Kremlin used all possible narratives, talking about uh, that Ukraine is full of Nazis, that Ukraine discriminated Russian-speaking minority, uh, or that Russia leads an anti-colonial movement and opposes the U.S. marinettes in Kiev. And despite of the fact that nothing came from this war from Russia, um, then genocidal attacks, right, or missiles falling on the hats of uh, Ukrainian civilians, many people abroad in the West still believe, at least partly, in these Russian narratives. To understand why this Russian propaganda works and how can Ukraine defeat it, we have invited Terrell Germain Starr. Terrell is an independent American journalist widely known for his coverage of the current Russian invasion of Ukraine. He is a founder and a host of Black Diplomats, a weekly documentary news show about civilian life in Ukraine. Before we go further, don't, li- don't forget to like, to share and subscribe to this channel and uh, send this interview to those who you think need to watch it and to listen what Terrell is telling us. Welcome, Terrell. Hey, thank you. Welcome from Kiev. Thank you so much. And uh, for our audience, before I start with the question, for our audience to understand that this night Kiev was hit by 20 missiles, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. Uh, and uh, I'm very thankful uh, for you that you have found time for this conversation despite this uh, massive attack. And I'm very sorry for asking this question, but just to understand uh, for our audience, how does it look like when your city where you live is being hit by attack of 20 cruise and ballistic missiles? Well, well, thank you for having me. How does it feel to be in Ukraine as Russia uh, fires cruise missiles at us first? Being in Kyiv, we are relatively lucky compared to other parts of the country. Uh, keep in mind that the Western military aid has provided a number of Patriot batteries uh, here, which are, you know, I forgot the exact number, but it's not enough to protect the whole country. And so while Kyiv is generally protected, you have other settlements around the country that are not. You have Kharkiv, for example, that was hit over the over the weekend constantly. There are uh, casualties there. A uh, tragic story about a woman whose daughter was killed on a bench and her and the father of this daughter was killed pre, you know, sometime previously before that. Um, what it feels like is you it, it's a it's a crackling uh, because you hear the explosion and you know likely it's the interceptor from the Patriot missile or some other uh, platform that intercepted the the missile and it explodes. And depending on how close the missile uh, travels, uh, for example, this morning, we saw the explosion of the intercepted missile uh, illuminate from the high, the sky, the the, um, high buildings, you know, Um, and so you see this light illuminating and it looks like a Christmas tree almost. And so you all have to worry about the debris that falls. And recently, those explosions sound closer and closer and closer to you. And it felt very much like the beginning of the war when it first began on February the 24th, most recently. And so this past week, especially, has been particularly rough. Uh, the critical infrastructure has been hit. And so it also feels like not having electricity, even as I'm talking to you, I'm fortunate to have electricity right now. So it, it, it's inconvenient. Um, it's deadly for for a lot of people. And it's terrifying. Yes, that is, of course, a t- terrible feeling. And everyone who spent a night in Kiev uh, during the Russian missile attack knows this sound of uh, the boom, boom, boom in the in the air and then you know okay if it's uh, interception it's okay but still as you mentioned the debris are posing danger and of course non-intercepted uh, missiles and uh, children are afraid um, pets are afraid elderly are afraid it's a terrifying terrifying feeling but uh, coming to the um that messiah day by day situation with your uh, work in ukraine you are an important voice 
uh, from Ukraine to uh, the world community. Sorry for asking uh, this very stupid and banal question, but how many times have you asked by people, with irony or seriously, with sarcasm or not, how many Nazis have you met in Ukraine? Okay, yeah. So, so basically, you, you get it from uh, like uh, the people who are kind of characterized as tankies or people who consider themselves anti-imperialists. And it's a disinformation campaign uh, that I that that targets this particular group of people. My response to it is is really simple. That one, I would me as a black man, I would not go to a country full of Nazis because it just wouldn't be safe and it would just be stupid on my part to do it. Because obviously, I can't fit. In, I can't quote unquote fit in in any case. Everyone knows who I am and what I look like, so I just wouldn't go for my own. Uh, to protect my own safety. That's the second thing. But then also, too, it's a narrative that Russia has pushed um, against Ukraine um, for, for a long time now. And it's usually directed towards the Azov Battalion that at its very beginning really had some far right extremist people in their in, 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 in their group. But then over the years have refined themselves to what they are today, which is the polar opposite of the extremists that were in their group when they first started in 2014. Um, they also based this on Ukraine uh, on this on on this lie that Ukrainians discriminate against Russian speakers. And by the way, a uh, vast majority of people in this country speak some level of Russian. I am not able to have a full conversation in Ukrainian, and so I have to use the Russian that I have. And people have no problem with that. I use it every single day. So that's just not true. You run into it a lot. I think that it's usually reserved online and it doesn't have the resonance that it that I think it used to have from the simple fact that I think people real pe people aren't going for it. I think people of logic and common sense don't believe it, but if you have people who are extremists who who no matter how much how many facts and how much how how, how much information counter to that point you present them are going to believe it. So those people, you just have to tend to leave them alone and let them and, and let them engage in their own ignorance. And I think the vast majority of people see Ukraine as a country that is evolving, that is maintaining itself as it's dealing with the genocidal occupation in large parts of its, of, of its territory. Indeed, and um, talking about uh, this real situation on the ground, we in Germany have recently on this Sunday uh, a situation in two regions, in Thuringian and Saxony, where far-right party alternative for Germany has got over 30% of votes. And we know that it is officially known, like advised by the police in Germany, there are um, areas in um, these regions where they do not recommend people who uh, look other than white just to go as visitors because bad things can happen there. I don't worry about that in Ukraine, by the way. I travel around Ukraine any place I want, and I have been to pretty much every part of this country, and I've never had a travel advisory because I'm black. Oh, that is great. Great to hear. I hope <laughs> that many people who believe still in this propaganda will, will listen to that and will hear the word from directly. <laughs> they won't, and they never come here. And that's the whole thing. A lot of the people who are saying this crap don't come to Ukraine and they know nothing about this country. But that is, I believe, one of the um, goals, very important goals, which your podcast, Black Diplomats, uh, fulfill and uh, aim to tell people from the ground what is going on, not from Sam Washington or Berlin or other studios, but from uh, from the ground. And um, your recent podcast on uh, the Black Diplomats was about uh, rehabilitation of Ukrainian victims of uh, Russian uh, sexualized attacks, of rape and other forms of sexualized violence. Um, do you think that this topic, which um, hit huge waves after liberation of Bucha in uh, spring 22, has been underreported by now uh, by the major media? Well, when, you, when it comes to conversations around sexual assault here in Ukraine, I, I would say 
that it, it's not that it's been underreported. It's just a very difficult story to report. And I am actively pursuing, um, I'm, I'm building relationships with organizations that support women who have suffered uh, from sexual assault by, by Russian soldiers. And I have been told that, yes, they are willing to work with me, but they have to get the women, and not only women, but it's men, their children, et cetera, who've also been assaulted. They're not ready to do it. And so when you do those type of interviews, usually, you know, and this is just for people who don't understand what type of reporting that's required to do this. Usually you need a, a psychologist or, or a mental health professional in the room as you are talking with this survivor. And then you also need to really do a really thorough job of what you're going to ask this person. You have to be aware of what triggers this person. So it requires a, a lot of, of pre-production, if you will, before you actually sit down and talk with the individual. You have to understand what individually get, you know, triggers them. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of times they, they're just not ready to have that conversation. I was told, for example, that I, they would be that one organization I'm working with, they would be ready to present the possibility of me interviewing someone in their group in the winter. So February, January, or something like that, because now they need to deal with the mental health rehabilitation. I don't know if that's a proper term for it. But basically, these people need to be counseled to go through what they've experienced. And so that's far more important than talking to me. So I don't think it's that media are underreporting it. It's just an incredibly difficult story to tell. It's a very difficult story to get someone to get before the camera to speak on. And it, if, as far as the men in particular, there's a lot of shame that goes around it, not because of the assault, but because of the the societal um, culture around manhood is about. And so that is the main issue why you may see some reports you're not seeing as many as I think that we would like to be in order to explore uh, this element of how the war has been dev has devastated the Ukrainian people. Indeed. Uh, uh, still, I, I'm pretty sure that you see that the reporting from within Ukraine by a person who lives in Ukraine, who knows Ukraine, is different than the reporting when it comes from outside. And there are different accents and different focus. Uh, what do you think is still underreported, what is overreported? So I think what is underreported is the type of work that I do is that, you know, just looking at the common life of how people deal with the occupation. A lot of people don't realize how big Ukraine is as a country. You know, because you've been here. You could be on one side of the country, i.e. Lviv, for example, where you may have missile, you know, missile strikes go to the West, of course. But if you live in Western Ukraine, just, it just, it's a whole different vibe in that part of the country. Whereas if you're going to Kharkiv, that's constantly bombed. Or even if you're in Kiev, which is a very protected uh, city, the capital, where you you know you know we wake up in the morning and we hear explosions, but in the west, but in the east, it's far different. But what what's really incredible here is that things run on time. The buses are on schedule. The trains are on schedule. It operates like a like a, like a typical European city, i.e. Berlin, i.e. other places. And I take trains here all the time. And I can tell you a thing, trains in Ukraine are more punctual very often than in Germany. That's true. Right. And, you know, as somebody who goes to Germany a lot, and in fact, I'm going to Germany in October and hopefully I'll see you there. In Ber I'll be in Berlin and a few other places. But Berlin transportation is a lot more punctual than New York. I don't want to digress. That's a whole other story. But at any rate, to your question, um, the stories that need to be told here are those uh, people who up resilience. and you know, about the mother who takes their children to school despite the threat of Russian missile strikes, the, the teacher who, who teaches class despite um, missile strikes or drone attacks. It could be about the chef. The one, one of my stories I did on a chef who was talking to me about how she, how she keeps her restaurant going and how people expect, you know, quality service and they come out to eat. Um, despite the threats of of of, uh, of, of Russian uh, missile strikes, 
all of these things are happening here. And I think that we see all of the gloom, gloom and doom uh, of the front that we don't, that we think that there's just constant suffering across this country. And that's not the complete story. And I think the reason why we're not hearing those stories is because they're considered human interest. They're considered soft. Um, they're considered um, kind of a a story that's not considered hard news. But it, it, it's kind of like the conversation around what's a what's the definition of a quote unquote tough interview of a politician? Is it one where you're going for the juggler, or is it one that actually informs people? Right. And so I think we in media are dealing. We're at a crossroads where we have to, where we really have to um, revisit what does it mean to deliver quality news to people and comprehensive news. And we're not getting comprehensive news out of Ukraine because our political, our struck, our, our journalism structure centers um, um, hard political news, and it and hard political news on its own doesn't properly contextualize the Ukrainian people. And and where that really sits is with the resilience and if you were to do more human interest stories you would have a co- better cultural understanding of ukrainians resistance and i think that's the number one thing that's missing there's so much cultural reporting that's lacking here because we don't un- we spent we spent all of our uh you know decades covering this part of the world from the russian lens from the moscow perspective from the correspondent from the washington post the new york times the Wall Street Journal, CNN, The Guardian, et cetera, that are based in Moscow. And the reason why you see more reportage in Ukraine is not only because of the war, but it's because they can't safely function in Russia. And so they're here in Ukraine almost by force, not because they willingly decided that this is an important capital, i.e. Kiev, where they need to set up shop to understand the Ukrainian perspective, but this war force them to do that. And you're not going to get a cultural understanding of why Ukrainians are so resistant to the quote unquote average Russian or the Russian opposition. If you don't take enough time to do the type of cultural stories that I do on black diplomats. And the reason I'll close out why my, my YouTube channel uh, is called black diplomats is because my, I, I, I came into this part of the world as a Peace Corps volunteer uh, when I was 20, year 20 21 23 years old and i was in georgia the country of georgia and i just noticed that when people would um converse with me they would ask me different types of questions they would ask my white colleagues and with the georgians you know like they have the whole concept of being caucasian which is different from the way we understand caucasian in america um and basically it would be a matter of because of your own history of dealing with racism in the United States, you will understand our history of Russian colonialism. And so when I was in Ukraine, I got the same type of engagement and people would come to me and say, well, you must understand because of the history of racism in your country. And so Black Diplomats is about what would the news coverage look like if people, if Black people, if people of color or people who are colonized who experienced the, the the legacy of colonization from Moscow and from Russia, it, what if they were telling the story? What if they were providing their perspective into the analysis and to the reporting? What would the journalism of this part of the world look like? And so for that reason, I named the Black Diplomats because I want everyone to believe that whether you're a Black, you're a person of color, or even if you're not, right? Like it, it's really designed to help people understand the, the the you know understand Ukraine for example with this current reporting from the perspective of Ukrainians because I treat Ukrainians like I would treat my own community and that comes from heart that comes from you caring that comes from decentering yourself and that comes from challenging power and that's what Black diplomats do and I wish that more media in general would embrace that mantra when they do reporting from there. I think that there are like absolutely amazing points you have just mentioned. The first one is this media focus, even reporting from Ukraine about Ukraine, still using Moscow lenses. Uh, just an example, when uh, two days ago, Kharkiv, a Ukrainian city in the east, one million inhabitant city was bombed by Russia, uh, one of the most important uh, American newspapers posted a story saying Kharkiv bombed by Russia-Ukraine claims. 
as if someone else could have bombed Kharkiv by incident. I don't know, like India, Japan, maybe the Ukrainians do with ballistic missiles. Who knows? And uh, another thing, of course, is um, before the full-scale invasion, from what perspective and under what circumstances Ukraine was in focus of media. And as a German person who worked for German media for a certain time, I know that uh, German media, they had their offices in Moscow. Yes, of course, like most media did. And uh, that meant that the journalists, they came to Ukraine just for a week and mostly when uh, there was something bad happening like um, some gas conflict with Moscow or maybe uh, mass protest, etc. And from Russia, they produced human stories like babushkas in the village or uh, some uh, music band or something else, uh, youth projects. And Ukraine was in the German media as a country of constant, constant conflict, a constant problem. And the Germans looked at that and said, why the hell can you, can you live just a normal life? Why you always have problems? And now the biggest German TV channel, IRD, has one only correspondent in Kiev, uh, Vasily Golod, who is a great person. I love him very much. He makes fantastic work. But I'm pretty sure that he was sent to Ukraine because he was young and he was a migrant. So he didn't, he didn't get a good position in Moscow, a respectful position. He was sent to a war zone just, okay, just got it. Maybe you will be able to prove yourself. Um, but that is that is how we have it in, in the Western media. But still, um, you have mentioned another very important aspect. Thank you for having mentioned it. Uh, it's colonialism and its resilience. I don't know from what part should I start. Maybe we should continue with the colonialists. For the, for the uh, German audience and for the Western audience in general, the question that Ukraine was colonized by Russia didn't exist for centuries. Ukrainians were seen as Russians. And the other question came, how can Europeans colonize Europeans? Yes, we Germans colonized Poles, we colonized Czech. For us, the question should be obvious, but still, oh no, like, Europeans cannot colonize Europeans. Well, okay, well, that's interesting too. I, I wish that uh, for those who are watching this, listening to it, um, there's a book called Black Marxism, and, it, and the, the author of the name uh, of the this book, it just it's just a blank. But here's the point: um, when you talk about white supremacy within the context of the United States, it was written by a, a black American uh, guy. Um, when he talks about racism and white supremacy, the premise of his book starts off with this with this idea that. You white Europeans did not start off with 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 um actually professionalizing racism and and, and and supremacist frameworks, but with black people. They started with their own people. When you talk about this whole thing of Europeans not colonizing Europeans, that's how it started. Okay, you know, whether you think about the Crusades, you think about a wide range of of, of events that happened throughout European history, Europeans have long colonized themselves. So this idea that they haven't done it. it it's just, I don't know. I, I just think that it's impossible to, 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 to think that Europeans haven't colonized themselves. And I honestly don't know where to start with such an illogical um, line of thinking. Like I'm, I sincerely don't, it's, it's puzzling to me. But when, you, you know, when you're thinking about Russia in, in particular, we, we, we have to realize that Russia as, we, as it's currently configured is not indigenous Russian land. We, we, we forget about the fact that Siberia was a Siberian canon. We forget about the fact that many of the um, autonomous republics there, because, you know, autonomous republics are in the southern part of Russia, were not indigenous Russian territory. They were people who, uh, who for lack of a better word, they're Asians, right? And, and, and or come from some from type of Asiatic uh, background. And so that happened over decades and decades of colonization that started with Russian... Uh, that started through Imperial Russia back in the 14, 15, 1600s. And so if Russia were truly a, a, a indigenous to itself by landmass, it would probably be roughly a little more than one third of itself or a little bit or two thirds of itself. It would not be, right? It, it would not be the big landmass that it is right now. And so 
Even even in the European territory of Russia, you think about Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, Udmurtia, Karelia, like it's all indigenous people. And, and it's not their territory, right? And so that's the first thing. And that was, and, and, and I think that, that that's the main thing. And so Russia right now functions as an internally colonized state. If you honor the configuration of Russia as it is as the Russian Federation, we're not even talking about the 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 Soviet project uh, to fourteen other um, other nations, which was pure colonialism by force by the barrel of a gun. Right. One of the my biggest gripes against a Western um, lib- a lot of Western liberals is that they operate under this assumption that Western imperialism is the only imperialism that exists. Right. Um, and here in Ukraine. The when you when you go when you travel around Ukraine and as you have and you go to places like Zaporizhia or Dnipro or Kharkiv or um, you go to Kherson, for example, uh, you will hear people talk about how they are resurrecting their Ukrainian culture and their Ukrainian identity, and so they and they will tell you that it's a result of being stripped of the opportunity to really embrace it because of decades and decades of Soviet rule. And so when you go to Central Asia, for example, where I've been many times, uh, you will you, you you will see in some of their museums, some of their national museums, uh, the the history of Russian of Russian occupation. In in Uzbekistan, for example, I went to a smaller town and I forgot the name of this town. It was in the Fergana Valley, I believe, but the but but the a curator of a really small museum was explaining that a disproportionate number of Uzbeks were sent to war, World War II, not because they not because of they needed bodies to do so. It was because the Uzbek was considered expendable, right? They were more expendable than the, the than the Russians. So a disproportionate number of their population was sent to World War II to die because. In the Soviet Union, if anyone were to complain about deaths, the Uzbek would have a lesser, no one cared that the Uzbek was killed disproportionately. And so you have this legacy that has been ongoing. And, and then what the Ukrainians are telling us, what the, 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 the Tatars are telling us, what the Crimeans are telling us, that the, the Estonians are telling us is that there is a, a, this, this colonial framework has created a Russianness, you know, a Russianness. And what it is, is that there is a, a culture amongst the average Russian person that gives them this feeling of superiority. Now, that is a very different context from saying, I, you know, from, from, from a t- targeting a Russian for being Russian. What people are telling us is that there is a Russianness that is permeating in their society that it doesn't matter if Putin is replaced or he dies tomorrow. Because of their Russianness context and because of their belief that they are superior, there are too many Russians who would elect another dictator. And so, and they will continue that rule. And when I talk with the reason why I talk about this is because it relates to my experience as a black American when I interrogate whiteness in the United States, which is very different from targeting a white person. Because whether it's Russianness, whether it's whiteness, whether it's being a man when you're dealing with sexism or homophobia, et cetera, we as individuals have the ability to say, you know what? I don't want to be a part of that. I'm going to push away from this. What the Ukrainian, what the Baltic person, what the Pole is telling us is that too many Russians are not pushing themselves away from Russianness. And until this happens, this colonial framework is going to continue, which is why every available poll shows that the Russian supports this war because they believe in colonial conquest. And that is a culture within Russian society that has nothing to do with Putin. It has everything to do with the people who sit by and who vote for him and don't run to the streets to 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 take him out just as Ukrainians and Poles and other people that were colonized by Russia do in their own societies.
Absolutely, I totally, totally uh, adore what you say because you, you, you really, uh, you really go to the root of the problem. And as a person who was uh, born and raised in in Russia on the Russian territory, in Russian culture, I totally see what you describe. And there is the whole complex of subtle sayings and subtle gestures uh, in this Russian uh, system when uh, from the very insulting but still daily sayings like when a people when a person starts to talk their native language a very calm calm reaction is why don't you why don't you talk like a human being and, and that describes that every language except of russian is being seen as a non-human language which is already way beyond anything which a, a decent person can say and that is still the beginning of the insult chain and mm -hmm. i know many people who were born in uh, the so-called autonomous republics like Bashkortostan, tatarstan for example and they have told me the same stories which the ukrainians told me that they were taught to be ashamed of their language of their culture of their clothes that they were taught that this can be just a um, a source like um, a seasoning for the greater Russian culture. Maybe once a year during like some celebration of the Soviet Union, one friend told me she uh, is a Bashkir that all her childhood long she was dreaming of having a face like a beautiful Russian girl, not an ugly Bashkir girl, because she was taught that being a Bashkir means being ugly. And that already puts you into a position of a person who accepts any any treatment as long as it's not brutal as a good like you're not being beaten it's good enough for you because you should be <laughs> thankful for that and that's exactly what the russians imposed in many in many regions destroying languages and destroying cultures talking about this this colonization thing um what is obvious for you what is obvious for me what is obvious for millions of um, ukrainians what is natural naturally being practiced by by russians why not only former colonial powers like UK, Germany, France ignore it, but why is it not being why is it not obvious for the countries which have suffered colonialism and have seen this experience as the victims of colonialism? Why is it possible for Russia to sell this narrative of uh, being anti-colonial power while being arch-colonial power? in Africa, in South America, in Asia? Oh, okay, thank you very much. That's a really good question. So let's focus on the continent of Africa um, right now. Um, there is a journalist from Nigeria and his name, uh, God, I'm blanking on names, uh, but basically it's, it's a journalist there who's really been doing some great reporting on um, Russia's use of Wagner across the continent of Africa. Um, in Mali, the Central African Republic, for example, among other countries. And the reason why, say, um, many countries on the continent of Africa are embracing Moscow uh, is several reasons. One, I think that we need to get to the genesis of, we have to, I think we in the West, and, I, and it's our responsibility to say that the West, we share a, a, an incredible amount of responsibility uh, for how our country has has operated and has colonized these countries and just left them for um, and, and left them in ruin, and there needs to be some account of of of, of reparations in order to repair the harm that Western policy and Western imperialism and Western colonialism have done to these countries. That's the first thing, and I think it requires some honesty and some self reflection that the UK that France and that the United States is not read in Germany, is not ready to do. So let's just start there. Secondly, you, you, you actually have to accept the fact that America has not, America, for example, my country, has not proven to be a very consistent and reliable partner to many of these places. That's the second thing. If you really want to beat Russia and being a partner, be a better partner. Let's just start there, right? Um, secondly, you have a lot of these countries, unfortunately, that are being led by dictators themselves who are Putin-esque and they use Wagner so they can maintain their own power. And so while I am fully ready 
to to hold my country and the West accountable for our actions. Um, a lot of these countries are led by military style dictators who don't care about their people. And they use these Wagner mercenaries to protect themselves, even as they rape and pillage their countries um, and, and, and commit mass sexual assaults against their population and strip them of natural resources, essentially replacing one colonizer for another. So it's a multifaceted issue here that requires a lot of nuance, but I think we also need to be mindful of the fact that when Zelensky ordered a peace summit, when he convened a peace summit in Switzerland, uh, roughly 30 countries from the continent of Africa showed up and signed a communique saying that they agree with this peace summit. So we need to be careful and mindful in saying that not all African countries are drinking Putin's Kool-Aid because they aren't. Now, more need to step up, right? But you have at least 30 countries on the continent of 20 or so, I would say 20 or so, maybe. But at any rate, um, you have 20 or so, 25 or whatever, that are saying that we're not drinking Putin's Kool-Aid and we're engaging Ukraine. But I also believe that we really need to do a better job of being sincere of fighting colonialism because at the end of the day, Putin doesn't care about imperialism or colonialism or anything like that. They don't care at all. And to be quite frank with you, a lot of these countries that are drinking Putin's Kool-Aid don't care about anti-Western imperialism either because many of these people, if you do enough digging, they send their children to the West to be educated, okay? And, 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 and they wear Gucci. So they could take their anti-Western imperialism bull drive and shove it where the sun doesn't shine. That's what I have to say about them. But if we, but, but from a policy standpoint, I think that the United States, we, from, from our side, we really need to do a better job of looking at the continent of Africa uh, from, as business partners, uh, engaging serious African leaders on, the, on, on trade. During our presidential um, elections, and during debates, we never have a conversation about the continent of Africa, ever. There has never been one question about the continent of Africa. If we do talk about South America, it talks about South America from this prism of fighting anti, you know, anti, anti-socialist um, parties, or we look at their leadership as being extremists, rather than saying, how can we get engage them in ways that will foster respect with these populations we don't have these holistic conversations and we need more of it but that will require a that will require a paradigm shift in how we think about foreign policy and how it needs to be directed to these countries and our current neoliberal construct isn't prepared for that because the american people are not electing those type of leaders who are thinking in that way unfortunately and until we do we're going to continue to have these problems where you have Russia that will be able to use disinformation, which, by the way, they do much better than us. America does a really bad job of fighting disinformation, very bad job. And until we start getting in that game and being competitive with them with honesty and also being strategic about getting in the disinformation field, then Russia is going to continue to pass on this narrative that they are the anti-colonialist, and then we're going to be um, on the back foot trying to catch up with the lie. Indeed. And uh, we know that uh, also from the Ukrainian side, uh, there are now many initiatives in bringing journalists from these countries to Ukraine, in uh, increasing mm -hmm. diplomatic presence there. And it is both done by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the NGOs. And it's a good thing that Ukraine is uh, trying now to address as many, as many nations as um, possible. But I want to come back to another point you have raised in your uh, in your uh, comments and your answers, and I think it's extremely important, this Ukrainian resilience, this day-by-day -day Ukrainian resilience, which is also um, not surprising for me, but very remarkable every time when I go to Ukraine, even if you're in Kharkiv, a city which is almost daily bombed by Russia, you see cafes, and in the cafes you see people hanging the shields, uh, Putin, you will not see us close. And uh, this is a sort of, I would say, a sort of a moral stand when people say, OK, it's bad, it's dangerous, but he will not see us being scared. He will not see us 
um, rejecting the values and the lifestyle we have. What is the source of their resilience? Well, the source of the Ukrainian resilience, uh, based on my own reporting and based on living here since 2008, has basically, it's basically, you know, this is a country that has a history of fighting Russian colonialism. Right. There has been multiple periods throughout this country where where this where where governments have been set up. Um, independent governments of Ukraine have been set up. It may have lasted three months or six months or a year, but they have that history of resilience. Some of that resilience is quite bloody. Some of it is were, were essentially um, human rights violations. And um, unfortunately, you're going towards, you know, when you think about the. Um, uh, uh, you know, like the Stefan Step Bandera era in some respects. But generally speaking, um, you know, this is a country that has very largely been one of uh, its own people, its own culture, its own traditions. And they, the part, what the Ukrainian resilience is reflected with the, with the fact that not only are they resurrecting that for themselves, many of them, they're also showing the world that we were always this way. And so we are so used to Russia being under the, not Russia, but Ukraine being under the Soviet Union that we never honored Ukrainians for being Ukrainians. And so I'm actually, I'm actually going through a constant education myself of, of really understanding Ukraine for Ukraine and understanding Ukrainian history as a foreigner like everyone else, right? And so, but I think a main thing about the resilience and, you know, from a perspective of, of why they're not submitting, I think that Russia does not, it never fully understood Ukrainians because they never really saw Ukrainians as being Ukrainians, right? Um, and the way that Russia is used to is used to winning is by bombing people to death, right? And we saw that with Syria. We saw that with the. Uh, we saw that with Chechnya. The reality is that this country is too big. The Russians don't have the resources to run this country over in the way that they would like to. And they and they really didn't feel like they needed to run this country over because they just thought that the Ukrainians would submit. And the reality of it is that the U Ukrainians, you know, if you want to take uh, you know, like a line from Kendrick Lamar, they, they not, you know, like the Ukrainians saying, you're not like us, right? You're like, you're not, you know, like you're not, we, we are not you. We are not going to submit. We do not need a king. So they are really a people who have always wanted democracy. They've always, they've, they've always functioned as democratic peoples. And so it's really strength. It really just stems from that tradition that they've existed under all along, the rest of the world is just finding out. Indeed, and that is that is what uh, I think in this war has uh, been demonstrated by the Ukrainians uh, very strongly, uh, the level of grassroots creativity, the level of responsibility, the low-level commanders, squad commanders, platoon commanders have overtaken, and most of them are civilians from uh, from the civilian jobs, and they knew from their civilian life how to organize the horizontal networks, how to uh, get in contact with civilian NGOs to get equipment they need, to get communication they need, and they organize this resilience. And the territorial defense of Ukraine, which have practically beaten the Russians at the Hostomel airport, is uh, something which is absolutely, absolutely remarkable in this, um, in this context. But um, taking, talking about like about uh, some other perspective, uh, you are a person from Detroit, right? Yeah. And Detroit is a city which uh, used to be uh, for a certain time a prosperous industrial center, then declined. Something mm -hmm. comparable to that has happened to Ukrainian Donbass. Do you see any similarities like that? In any histories, any stories which can help the West to understand Ukraine better. So 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 basically after um nineteen well Donbass, it depends on what element that you're talking about. You know, Donbass is was one of the most russified it is arguably the most russified region 
uh, in Ukraine, and that came as a result of colonization. So let's just make that clear. It, it, it was a Russified, thus colonized part of Ukraine, um, one where um, one that's rich with natural resources or et cetera, right? Steel. And so I, I would say the, I, I would say, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I can think of any particular comparison directly, but what I would say is that I believe that the lessons that we can learn that, that we in the West uh, should be mindful of is, is that like Donbass, Detroit is a black city, was under constant attack because in the 1970s, it dared to be black. It dared to be a city with the majority of black people that dared to elect this first black mayor to live independent and to center black people in the largest city in the state of Michigan. I think that what Detroit dealt with in regards to white backlash, um, you, you see in Russification, you see in further disinformation campaigns across the Donbass where that refused to let Ukraine function and exist on its own, right? And so when I think about colonialism, you know, it, it's really a, it's really a, an extension of racist urban planning, right? So let's take, for example, in Detroit. Detroit being the largest black city in the United States, um, you have redlining, political redlining, redlining where black people could live in certain parts of the city that were separated where, other, where whites could live. Um, it was a city that was racially stratified in order to suppress black people. And so I think that when you think about colonialism, it's really nothing more than an internationalized version of that. And so the way that I understand the rest of the world and the reason why I can personalize, contextualize Ukraine in the way that I do is that I look at what's happening in the larger part of Ukraine, including Donbass, as a larger extension of a particular type of discriminatory type of urban planning that is reserved for cities, parks, et cetera. But it's just internationalized to partition borders and steel borders and to regulate people based on your own racist, frame, you know, uh, uh, or in this case, Russian supremacist framework. And so I do see similarities between, you know, the Detroit dynamic and the Donbass dynamic and that the urban planning concept that was used to um, destabilize Black Detroit is very similar to the colonial framework that Moscow uses to destabilize Ukraine. In that respect, you have the domestic um, policies of discrimination that match up really directly to the internationalized version of colonialism that is used to suppress, oppress, and discriminate against um, 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 Ukrainians. Indeed, and uh, this is maybe the core of uh, the of our discussion that uh, there are so many layers of how people can get oppressed. There are so many layers how their identity can be oppressed, erased, and how they can be targeted because of their identity. And we need to go uh, to the field, talk to people, and understand uh, what is going on, not listening, uh, firstly and foremostly, to the oppressor, because yeah. uh, they are so cool, they are. They have their seat in the UN Security Council, not listening to uh, the oppressed. But you know what that is, though, right? But you know that why that is, Sergey. So, so basically, you know, for example, with me, my master's degree is in Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies. One of my masters, and these centers for Russian and Eastern European studies started off with a very centered Russia. And the way that our education has been set up in the United States in this area study has been that uh, power of centering one power versus another. And so we look at Russia as the global power, and we really did not center the individual republics that they colonized because they were all operating under the, under the rule of Moscow. And so it was only after 1991 where we really had to begin to think about these individual nations, the Uzbekistans, the Kazakhstans, the 
Georgias, the Azerbaijans, the Lithuanias, uh, even Poland's, for example, um, Belarus as their own individual countries. And so I think that I was really fortunate in my education where I came in after living two plus years in Georgia, where I didn't come in from a Moscow lens or a Moscow perspective. I saw things from the Caucasus Mountains perspective and not from Moscow. But many of the education structures in the United States centers Russia. And so one of the reasons why we have such a focus on Russia is because we've been trained to. And so Ukrainians are, are saying that you have to untrain yourself. And one thing that American whiteness and a lot of people who subscribe to it don't like is, is, is someone telling them that they need to change. And, 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 and it really is like they, they, there's a real resistance towards that. I wrote a articles in the Washington Post several years ago, and I think the headline was something about Russian supremacy or something like that. And it just made people go crazy. And I found it, it, it was maybe back in 2015 or 2016, people, it, they went wild, right? And the biggest irony of it is that years later, after the war, after this big war, 2022, that article actually has more credence than it did when I first wrote it because the oppressor and people who subscribe to the oppressor's thinking are not used to being challenged. And so our whole education system, the way that we think about this, our whole journalism infrastructure is being challenged and it makes them very, very uncomfortable. Who the hell is this country of 40 some million people telling us that we need to change the way that we that that we spell key who the hell is this country that's telling us that you need to speak ukrainian what what goal do they have what audacity how dare they tell us this now they may not say that directly to the ukrainian space but the air with which i i have seen people operate it gives that feeling because i'm used to white people in America, too many of them um, responding to black resistance, i.e. George Floyd, i.e. Mike Brown in 2014, telling us how dare you stand up for yourself, right? And so when you, ch when you challenge the system like the Ukrainians are doing, it's going, to, it's going to be a very uncomfortable process for everyone, but no one is more uncomfortable than the Ukrainian who has to wake up every morning with the prospect of being killed by a Russian cruise missile or a drone attack and the many other people who've been killed here throughout the weeks and throughout the years because Russia decided that Ukraine shouldn't be free. So to hell with the Russians' comfort, to hell with the Westerners' comfort about how they need to look at Ukraine. Um, we need to change ourselves. And until we change the way that we view this part of the world, then we're going to get it wrong. That makes us no different than the than the murderers and, and the Kremlin, as far as I'm concerned, to, to, to a certain extent. We need to change. And that requires us to think maybe the policy of not allowing Ukraine to strike into Russia over fear of an escalation um, needs to change. And so I don't want to get, I'm going to end because I'm kind of getting into a tangent, but I wanted to really follow up with what you were saying in regards to um, the way that we, the, the way that this, you know, the power dynamic is set up, because that's such an important part of it. And until we get new perspectives that look at this country in, the, in, in, in a new way, then we're going to have these kind of dull, um, esoteric conversations about the great power dynamic that does nothing to empower Ukrainians to protect themselves and to join the rest of Europe where they belong. And that is exactly what we need, an uh, uncomfortable truth being uh, said loud and many times against this esoteric conversation and meaningless talks about the great power dynamics, uh, big chessboard and interests of greater nations. was an amazing, amazing, insightful uh, conversation with a uh, Terrell German star who is an independent American journalist, widely known for his coverage of the current Russian invasion 
of Ukraine. He is now in Kiev and has spent this night under Russian bombs. Thank you so much, Terrell, that you have found time for this. Terrell is a uh, founder of uh, and a host of uh, Black Diplomats podcast, a weekly documentary news show about civilian life in Ukraine. Thank you so much for this conversation and stay safe. Thank you. And don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel so uh, you will never miss interviews like this.